Uh, hello and welcome to our second panel of the day, a panel that zooms in on something that was touched upon several times uh, yesterday, the issue of um, the Judeo-Bolshevik trope, and the panel that will seek to deconstruct this trope in three different contexts. And um, the geographical focus also shifts from the colonial peripheries with which we dealt um, in the last panel of yesterday and the panel this morning to Eastern Europe and to the Eastern European periphery. And our first paper in the panel is um, by Brendan Francis McKeever from the Pears Institute for Study of Antisemitism at Birkbeck in London. Um, Brendan has completed his PhD in Glasgow dealing with the Bolshevik response to antisemitism during the Russian Revolution. And his presentation today is also um, following those lines. Um, he's currently an early career fellow at the Pears Institute and will soon take up a position as a lecturer in um, sociology of radicalism and antisemitism at Birkbeck University of London. The title of the paper is Antisemitism and Class Politics in the Russian Revolution, 1917 to 1921. The floor is yours, Brendan. Thank you very much. And just want to start by saying it's a real honor to be here uh, in Vienna at this wonderful conference. And I want to thank Bella, Eva, and Greta, I'm not sure if I pronounce your names properly. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for accepting my proposal uh, and putting me up in this wonderful hotel as well, by the way. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just start then. The Russian Revolution of 1917 uh, was the high point of class struggle in the 20th century. For the first time in world history, a social movement predicated on overcoming not just class exploitation, but other forms of oppression and domination actually succeeded in gaining state power. This promise of a world free of racism, free of oppression, spread far and wide, reaching a truly multi-ethnic global audience. And it's captured very powerfully in the writings of American black writer Claude McKay, who some of you might know of. Now what's interesting about McKay, here he is speaking before the uh, Fourth Congress of the Comintern in 1922 in Moscow. What's interesting about McKay is that his interest in Bolshevism stems specifically from its record on anti-racism and on fighting anti-Semitism. Writing in 1921, McKay proclaimed, this is his words, every Negro should make a study of Bolshevism and explain its meaning to the colored masses. Bolshevism has made Russia safe for the Jew. It has liberated the Slav peasant from the priest who can no longer egg him on to murder the Jews. And it might make the United States safe for the Negro. If only the Russian idea should take hold of the white masses, then the black toilers will automatically be free. In the very moment of revolution, however, in 1917, these sentiments had been put to the test as brutal anti-Jewish pogroms raged across the western borderlands of the, Russian, the former Russian Empire and Pale of Settlement. The pogroms posed fundamental questions of Marxist theory and Marxist practice, and of the whole Bolshevik project as well, because it revealed the extent of working class and peasant attachments to anti-Semitic and indeed racialized forms of consciousness. Now the paper today is drawn from a PhD which has already been said, I recently defended. Uh, and what I do in the PhD, first and foremost, is try to explore the Bolshevik response to this wave of anti-Semitism within the working class and the peasantry. And more specifically, I explore who brought this response into being. Which political currents within the Bolshevik project were responsible for actualizing a response to anti-Semitism. And not just who, but how. How theoretically, how politically did the Bolsheviks handle the question of working class anti-Semitism? And also the fact that the Bolsheviks themselves were part of the anti-Semitic projection. How did they handle all of these explosive nuances? I'm not going to discuss any of that really in the paper today, unfortunately. Uh, what I want to look at today is what I call the articulation between anti-Semitism and the revolutionary process. Anti-Semitism traversed the full range of 
the full spectrum of politics in revolutionary Russia. No political formation, the Bolsheviks included, stood outside of this process. So I want to move beyond neat categorical distinctions between anti-Semites on the one hand and anti-anti-Semites on the other hand, or revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries, and instead uncover the complex process through which anti-Semitism could overlap and even become articulated by and through, expressed within a revolutionary politics, and Bolshevism in particular. The main focus of the talk today then is anti-Semitism in the Red Army. Now, so just to add here, the Bolshevik response to anti-Semitism was a response to anti-Semitism of its own social base and its own cadres. That's really, really important. The finding that, that, that there was anti-Semitism in the Red Army is no surprise. Everyone here, I'm sure, is aware of Babel's famous Red Cavalry short stories, and in particular, is a character, Gedali, who has this really powerful uh, question that he poses, you know, which is revolution and which is counter-revolution? You know, this is the, the, um, the articulated anti-Semitism within revolutionary politics. Nevertheless, despite the fact that this is one of the most well-known pieces of Soviet fiction, the Red Army pogroms are the most un, or understudied, and to an extent even unstudied, actually, uh, of all the pogromist movements in the Civil War. So in the book that I'm currently writing, I'm trying to redress this historiographical deficit, and I'll try and do it a bit again in the paper today. I don't just want to document Red anti-Semitism, I want to understand it and explain it. Uh, before we begin, I should say from the outset that Red pogroms, uh, or the Red Army rather, were the least prone to pogroms among all the military, revolutionary, counter-revolutionary forces in the Russian Revolution. Gergel, in his classic 1951, actually 1948, the Yiddish original study, calculated that the Red Army was responsible for 8.6%, okay, this was his calculation, 8.6% of all pogroms. If you look at the column on the far right-hand side here, and scroll down to 8.6, that's the Soviet army. Uh, Petlura's army are 40%, Denikin 17%, and so on. Uh, the sources are not really that great, but th that was the best he could come up with. Nevertheless, I want to place this 8.6% center stage, not because of its numerical significance in the overarching pogrom wave, but rather I place it center stage because of the fundamental questions that 8.6 posed of the whole Bolshevik project and its anti-racist promise. The red pogroms blew apart the epistemological frame through which Bolsheviks and most Marxists made sense intellectually of anti-Semitism. The Bolshevik leadership held fast to very neat categorizations in which anti-Semitism was framed as the preserve of counter-revolution. This is an example. This is a pamphlet against anti-Semitism titled Counter-Revolution and Jewish Pogroms. It's very clear. Uh, this is a pictorial representation, a Bolshevik poster, which uh, the title in Yiddish and Russian is The Spread of Jewish Pogroms According to the Perpetrators and it's counter-revolutionary forces that are depicted here visually in this poster. Or here's a 1929, much, much later poster. Anti-Semitism, the title says, is conscious class, is conscious counter-revolution, our class enemy. It's a very, um, it's a very, um, in each of these representations, there's a clear line of demarcation between anti-Semitic counter-revolutionaries and anti-anti-Semitic Bolshevik internationalists. Now, what I found in the archive is that in 1918 and 1919, such lines of demarcation simply did not exist. The reality of the political field was much, much messier than Bolshevik rhetoric implied. And in the Western borderlands around Ukraine, these distinctions between revolution and counter-revolution collapsed along an axis of anti-Semitic violence. And I want to just give you a flavor of some of this stuff. This is a Bolshevik pamphlet against anti-Semitism. It's a representation of anti-Semitic violence. It's significant, I want to argue, that the very first pogroms that broke out after the October Revolution 
were not carried out by counter-revolutionary white army or Ukrainian nationalists, but by the Red Army itself in various towns and cities of Chernigov and the Ukrainian Northeast. Now, the pogroms took place in the context of the Soviet retreat after the German advance in early 1918 after the 11-day war and the signing of the treaty in Brest-Litovsk. There were a number of Red Army pogroms, but the most brutal one was in Gluchov or Gluchiv in the Chernigov region. The Bolsheviks came to power in Gluchov in the spring of 1918 under the slogan, smash the bourgeoisie, smash the Yids. When the Red Army arrived in Gluchov, they lined up entire Jewish families in the town square and assassinated them on the spot and then lifted up the red flag with the slogan, long live the international. This, however, was merely a precursor to what came in 1919 after the Bolsheviks took power again in Ukraine, having been pushed out. During the spring and summer of 1919, anti-Semitism was so strongly developed within the Red Army that the files on the Red Army reports in every single province of Ukraine show red anti-Semitism, even in the units that did not carry out pogroms. Bolshevik agitators who were against anti-Semitism simply could not go near their own Red Army troops on many occasions for being shot on the spot uh, as Yid speculators and so on. Political work among the Red Army is entirely impossible, said one report into the Soviet First Army. Because anti-Semitism is so strongly developed, pogroms are a daily occurrence. Now, I've gone through every single Red Army report for 1919 in Ukraine. And one of the most common slogans of the Red Army troops in this period is, smash the Yids, long live Soviet power. So again, the lines of demarcation between revolutionary and counter-revolutionary, anti-Semite and internationalist, so clear in the minds of Bolshevik intellectuals and Bolshevik radicals, were, in the actuality of the social field, categories that were fluid and porous. People moved between these categories. Sorry. Uh, emblematic of this wave of red anti-Semitism was the uprising of Grigoriev's sixth Soviet army in the spring and summer of 1919. I don't have time really to go into this, but Grigoriev uh, entered into an alliance with the Bolsheviks in the March of 1919. Uh, the Bolsheviks accepted him into the Red Army because he had 15,000 troops, uh, and he agreed to smash the bourgeoisie. This is a photo of Grigoriev and the commander of the Red Army in Ukraine, Anton Vasenka. The site, however, of Grigoriev's troops arriving into Ukrainian towns and cities in the south provoked and sent panic through the Jewish population. In early May, Grigoriev's sixth Soviet army rebelled against the Soviet government, carrying out the most vicious wave of pogroms in the whole Russian civil war. Not in terms of their numerical significance, only 3,500 Jews were killed, but of those Jews that were physically attacked, the fatality rate was 80%. This was a murderous anti-Semitism. Now, when the news of this came through to the Bolsheviks' center, uh, to use the center periphery distinction, they carried out a huge campaign in the press saying, Grigoriev is counter-revolutionary, he's an agent of the bourgeoisie, and so on and so forth. However, the anti-Semitism of Grigoriev and his troops <coughs> was just one manifestation of this articulation between revolutionary populism and revolutionary politics and anti-Jewish violence. Just have a look at this proclamation that Grigoriev gave to his troops before the pogrom. I'll let you just read it for a second. Can everyone at the back see it? Okay. Now, Grigoriev is articulating here a non-referential anti-Semitism. The Jews are not named explicitly, but the key signifiers of an anti-Semitic discourse are all in place. The Ukrainians have been deceived by a people more clever than them. The specter of the bloodsucker, of course, is invoked. Honest workers with calloused hands are ruled by Christ killers from Moscow, the speculators. 
Above all here, what you can see is a signification of the well-worn anti-Semitic conception of labor. The Jew is necessarily non-productive. The Jew is an extractor of surplus labor, not a producer of it. The real toiler, the oppressed, is the bearer of concrete, productive labor. The peasant, unlike the Jew, in counterdistinction to the Jew, has an organic relationship to the land and to the nation. And this actually is frequently gendered, going back to a previous point that, we made, that you made in the previous session. Gregoria does not need to mention the Jew here. This is completely understood. Anti-Semitism is so explosive, the, mes the message is clear. And this is a kind of illustration of that staggering extent, actually, to which revolutionary discourse and populist anti-bourgeois sentiment could overlap with and be expressed within uh, violent anti-Semitism. Okay, this is all the level of description. Let's understand what is going on here. Who are these people that are carrying out these pogroms? In 1918, the data is extremely hard to come by. It seems that most of the pogromists in uh, the Chernigov region actually come from Smolensk and other parts of Russia and are working class, interestingly. Though, who is working class in this time? Most of these people are peasants and workers at the same time. Uh, but the data is very thin. 1919, however, is much clearer. The main agent of Red Army anti-Semitism is the partisan peasant soldier, mobilized by Bolshevik radical anti-bourgeois discourse. Now, this, these armies that we're talking about in 1919 are not a regular standing army centrally organized by Trotsky, as they would soon, very, very soon come to be, but rather these, these are, it's a kind of loose assemblage of irregular peasant partisan units. In the Ukrainian center, the Bolsheviks took power in 1919 by extending their social base deep into the rural periphery through the mass mobilization of the peasantry. And they were successful in doing so. They took Ukraine in this way. But it was a deeply contentious social base, profoundly unstable. If partisans declared they would fight for Soviet power, that they would smash the bourgeoisie, they were admitted en masse into the army without being checked or screened. 90% of all Red Army troops in Ukraine in 1919 are composed of these partisan insurgent units, largely drawn from the peasantry. And many of them, in fact, had previously been in anti-Bolshevik military units as well. So, many within the Bolshevik social base in Ukraine fought for a populist conception of Soviet power, of the people, of the laboring people, against the capitalists, the speculators, and the exploiters, and so on. These were standard categories of Bolshevik re re revolutionary discourse. And as far as Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Sverdlov, and others in the center were concerned, these were the, precisely the kinds of class concepts that would cut through anti-Semitism and lead the way to a revolutionary subjectivity. In the Russian Revolution, and especially in the Ukrainian conjuncture, however, these standard categories of class struggle were understood on the ground in profoundly anti-Semitic dimensions. The very words Ukrainian and Jew simultaneously bore not just ethnic characteristics, but class overdeterminations as well. In the popular imagination, the Ukrainian was a true and honest toiler who put their hands to productive and concrete labor, as I've said already. The Jew, amongst other things, was the antithesis of this, the non-laborer, speculator, and so on. So the categories that the Bolsheviks reserved for class analysis, the bourgeoisie, the toiler, the oppressed, the exploiter, these meant something very, very different on the ground when they were mobilized and actualized in political, in, in political subjectivity. And actual class relations are important here. Ukrainians constituted 80% of the Ukrainian, uh, of the total population of Ukraine, and 4% of the, of, of, of the working class. In contrast, Ukrainians were 91, perhaps even 95% of the peasantry in this period. So the, the working class in Ukraine is composed largely of ethnic minorities, Russians, Jews, and a small amount of assimilated Ukrainians who have a kind of Russificatory perspective. And in contradiction to this is the overwhelmingly ethnic Ukrainian peasantry. So nationality, ethnicity, and class frequently manifested as interlocking experiences. 
In Ukraine, the national question was felt at the point of production, at the point of exchange. And within this, this contradictory social formation, revolutionary class discourse was fr frequently taken up on the ground within a set of social struggles shaped not just by class antagonisms, but by the politics of ethnicity and anti-Semitism as well. And what the Bolsheviks tried to do to deal with this was to counterpose class to ethnicity. But ethnicity was profoundly, was profoundly classed. Ethnicity was a class frame of experience in this moment. How many? Five minutes. Oh, I'm definitely finished before five minutes. Be three. <laughs> so, anti-Semitism, I want to argue, was the current, the conduit through which many peasants and indeed some workers and many, many Red Army soldiers moved between the camps of revolution and counter-revolution. Anti-Semitism and the populist conception of Bolshevism were coextensive worldviews, coextensive projects. And it was in this context that the slogan, smash the Yids, long live Soviet power, could get such traction uh, on the ground. And I was going to uh, conclude there, that is the end of the talk, uh, when I thought it was 20 minutes, not 25. But uh, I just want to add something uh, at the end of this, and it's in relation to um, some of the things that were discussed yesterday by Nathan uh, Schneider and Stefan Vogt. And it's this issue of universalism and particularism, the dialectic between them. Uh, the Bolsheviks during this period, well, I mean, the Bolshevik center, the, 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 the upper echelons, very much welcomed the Jews into the Soviet project and the communist regime even. And they took a very strong standpoint against anti-Semitism. This is widely known. But no one's actually ever thought to study just how the party responded to anti-Semitism. And not just how, as I said at the start, but who. Who led the campaigns? Who actualized this anti-anti-Semitic standpoint? Who turned this standpoint into literature, newspaper articles, demonstrations, meetings, po uh, posters, lectures, pamphlets, and so on? And the answer is this group of people here, the Jewish Commissariat, a group of not yet fully assimilated Jewish radicals who combined revolutionary agency with a self-identificatory Jewishness. What I mean by that is they engage with the revolution as Jews as well as being radicals. And they were deeply engaged in a variety of diasporic Jewish cultural projects, whether it be a Yiddish-inflected Bundism, or indeed Marxist Zionism, such as the Jewish Communist Party, uh, who came from Palyetzion, Labour Zionism. That's a group of them here. There was an urgency and an ethical imperative that <coughs> underlay this response to pogroms. Their response to anti-Semitism was not the politics of instrumentalism or tactics. They spoke from a deeply felt subject position as Jews. So it seems then, in conclusion, and to come back to the discussion yesterday, that in the Russian Revolution, the closer one stood politically to a Jewish socialist project, the more likely one would be to elevate anti-Semitism in one's political practice. The more particularist and peripheral, the more the universalist standpoints of the center were actualized into real political practice. That's the, the finding, I guess. Um, but I look forward to more discussion, perhaps, in later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan, for a fascinating and very nuanced um, start to this panel. I'll quickly move now to introduce the second speaker because I think that we'll need time for discussion. The second speaker is uh, Tomasz Kende, who studied history and Russian philology in Budapest, has studied social history of um, the Russian peasantry in the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. 
and uh, has written on the phenomenon of, of uh, blood libels and on anti-Semitism in Russia, Hungary and the Czech Republic. And within his presentation today, we move the focus from Bolshevik anti-Semitism to pitching this against the notion of, of Jewish communism in a presentation that's entitled Jewish communism versus Bolshevik anti-Semitism or the quest for an ultimate adjective. Tomasz, the floor is yours. Thank you. After Brendan, uh, I don't need to thank the organizers and I can miss certain points from the prehistory of my uh, story. On the very first day following the Bolshevik takeover in Petrograd, a detailed quasi-historical explanation was already by the end for those who, from the standpoint of the losers, wished to explain the unexpected. Of course, here we refer to the notorious protocols of the elders of Zion. It is enough to mention the otherwise extraordinary boring diaries of Nicholas II, where he uses the book of Nilus, Knigub Nilusa, that is the protocols, to explain his fall and the victory of the revolution. And among the losers explaining the unexpected revolution with the help of the protocols, beside the semi-idiotic last emperor of all the Russians, we could find Hindenburg as well as Sir Winston Churchill in the early 1920s. Long and, I must confess, sometimes even interesting monographs have been written on the origins of the protocols, and interesting historiographical texts are also available on the protocols' impact on the post-Bolshevik revolution anti-communist narratives. One may call proverbial the parallel historiographical and political recycling of the protocols in the Russian white emigrants' publications in Polish, Hungarian, and so forth, and so forth, counter-revolutionary texts. It is also well known that from the very birth, from, from the very birth of the young Soviet state, the, this young Soviet state has launched a huge anti-anti-Semitic propaganda. Thousands of brochures, dozens of historical monographs sponsored and published by various Soviet Russian agencies were to, fight, were to, were to serve the fight against the alleged anti-Semitic heritage of the Tsarist regime. According to the new regime's canon, one of the system specifics of the Tsarist regime has been anti-Semitism and thus one of the new regime's central tasks was to fight the anti-Semitic legacy. And it were not only the Bolsheviks who have thought so. One of the first deeds of the also revolutionary temporary government was to form a special committee, Cheka to study the crimes and the criminal nature of the Tsarist regime. This committee has launched a legal investigation to prove the Tsarist highest authorities, if not, the, if not that of the very Tsar's organizing role in the last celebrated blood, blood libel case in Imperial Russia, that is the Bailis case. Although, quoting a white emigrant's brochure published in the, early, in, in the mid 1920s in <laughs> Belgrade, and now quoting him, the Jews possessing, now the Jews now possessing every archives and juridical power could not prove the Tsarist regime's involvement into the Bailis affair, end of, end of the quotation. The Cheka of the provisional government has produced, and later on published by the Bolsheviks, a very valuable set of historical sources regarding the very case of the Bailis affair, as well as the perception of anti-Semitism as such, and or that of the Bailis affair, by the anti-monarchist political forces from the constitutional Democrats to the Bolsheviks. Despite the fact that I have been studying the blood libel cases of East and Central Europe for almost 20 years, and it is tempting to speak about them, now I have to make a full stop and go back to our current topic. For the Bolsheviks' consequent fight against anti-Semitism and for the unprecedented as well as unconditional assimilation of the previously discriminated Russian Jewry, the anti-Bolshevik literature and propaganda has long emphasized the Jewish elements in the Soviet regime and its very fundamental Jewishness. The renewed, modernized mutations of the protocols concentrating on the alien, I mean Jewish nature of communism in Eastern Europe, have fundamentally characterized the anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist narrative, narratives in the interwar period. And they are rather frequently recycled by even for the first sight well-educated academicians in our regions nowadays. But the World War II, the Holocaust, the birth of Israel and the Cold War have produced, pardon me, uh, have produced, uh, blah, blah, a new, totally new paradigm in the Jewish related, but as in the case of the previous one, briefly described above, also anti-communist and very superficial description of the communism. The new paradigm has been laid down by Hannah Arendt. 
In this new paradigm, there was no more place for the inherited from the protocols anti-Semitic explanations of the communism, Bolshevism as such. The contrary has taken the place of it. While, the previously, while, while previously it was the Jewish, the ultimate adjective of communism or Bolshevism, after Arendt, communism has become rather anti-Semitic. For communism ought to be equal in every sense and ways with Nazism. Beside Arendt, the very systems from the Soviet Union to Czechoslovakia have, the, have, have done their best in helping to create this, this new paradigm. Following the birth of Israel, anti-Jewish, which is not necessarily anti-Semitic, politics have been launched. We all know that in the early 1930s, in an interview given to an American journalist, Stalin has called anti-Semitism a form of cannibalism. Okay, Stalin was a great actor, but on the last Central Committee session he participated on, at the very end of 1952, the same Stalin said something very strange. One has to know that for his own health condition, he at that time was already dying slowly. He was a decaying alcoholic at that time. And for other reasons, for, for instance, the Central Committee has ceased to be a political tool after 1934 and has turned into a representative body. Stalin has not frequently visited its sessions. And in the very late of 1952, during the anti-Jewish campaign launched by himself, Stalin said on the, uh, on the Central Committee session, Unas Centralum Comitete Antisemitis Avelis, Eta Bezebrasia. In our Central Committee, anti Semites have came out. This is, uh, this is an outrage. The word Zavelis is usually used in Russian for the description of the appearance of insects. Uh, the Stalinist anti Jewish politics, and especially the most important, the Soviet one, have never been the actual rebirthers of the pre revolutionary anti Semitism. The anti-Jewish campaigns of the Soviet Union and other state socialist countries are rooted in the Stalinist Bolshevik paranoia regarding every national minority possessing on the one hand some national autonomy and or institution, institutions and on the other a hostile national motherland abroad. That's why, for example, Hungarians were not uh, en masse and as Hungarians uh, executed in 1937-38 for being Hungarians, simply because they didn't have any national institutions and autonomy in the Soviet Union. Not like Poles, for instance. During the second phase of the 1937-38 uh, Great Terror, tens of thousands of ethnic Germans, Poles, Latvians, Finns, Romanians have been executed for this paranoia as potential spies in the Soviet Union. During the execution of this bloody campaign, each and every Oblast NKVD branch has received a national quota to be fulfilled and later on executed. The launched in, in 1948 anti-Jewish campaign's prelude is rather this 1937-38 national spy hunting than the pre-1917 anti-Semitism. Even if we know that the anti-Jewish campaign didn't produce such a horrendous death toll that the second phase of the Great Terror did. This inner, I mean, Soviet Bolshevik origin of the no doubt existing anti Jewish Stalinist politic, politics have been noticed by certain representatives of the totalitarian school. For instance, Norman Neimark, especially in his book called Stalin's Genocide, by talking quite lengthy on the similarities between Nazism and Bolshevism's anti Semitism, willingly was forced to touch upon the Stalinist politics against certain other nationalities in, in 1938 and during the war, while naming, as similar to the Jews' victims, the Germans, Chechens, Tartars, and so forth, he speaks exclusively about the historical origins of the anti Polish measures of the Bolsheviks in late 1930s, early 1940s. For, Nar for Narmaik, and I suppose for others, it had to be the alleged traditional Russian anti-Polonism, or on another place he calls it anti-Panism, bingo. By buying his point for an abstraction, I just want to ask, and what about the Finns, the Romanians, the Latvians, not to mention Greeks, Bulgarians, Kurds, Meskets, Mes and, so, and so forth, and so forth. Anyway, the previously anti-Semitic description of communism has regularly been replaced by a different totalitarian one, which instead of the alleged Jewishness has rather emphasized decoded into the system anti-Semitism. Nowadays, this latter narrative seems, seems to be the master narrative on communism. No wonder that the most influential informal pupil of Hannah Arendt, Timothy Snyder, pays a central attention to the Stalinist communist anti-Semitism. 
Timothy Snyder's Bloodland, that is new as Black Earth use, uncritically Hannah Arendt's thesis in emphasizing the systems of the communist system, anti-Semitism. I don't wish to challenge Snyder's Arendtian points, I just wish to raise certain questions on the base of a frequently cited memoir of Boris Bajanov. Bajanov's memoir, memoirs are best known from the 1979 English, I'd rather say American, and the 1980 emigrant Russian editions. Bajanov has been Stalin's, and the Politburo secretary before he has fled through Persia and India to the West in 1928, January the 1st. And then in a half a century, Bajanov has produced a chrestomatical memoir. Each scholar studying the Soviet Stalinist, Stalinian anti-Semitism sooner or later comes to Bajanov's memoirs. Bajanov brings up many cases, recollections to illustrate Stalin's personal anti-Semitism as well as of the system's anti-Semitism. The 1979 memoirs of, of Bajanov have become crucial evidences for the modern scholars of anti-communism and anti-Semitism. If one reads these memoirs with the elementary criticism, may say that these recollections of Bajanov are suspiciously Christomati-like ones, especially regarding the Jewish question. Especially if one heard about the author's mesalliance with the Nazis during Paris occupation. Bajanov, by 1979, had a lengthy record of collaborations. And from now on, regarding Bajanov's biography, we refer to his own recollections, his own memoirs, if one prefers, to his own apologies. 1919, Bajanov joins the local Ukrainian Communist Party organization and was soon afterward elected a district, Rayon secretary. Quickly rising through local party posts in the Ukraine, he went to Moscow to study engineering in November 1920. In 22, he applied for a technical position with the Central Committee Apparatus and was expect, <laughs> accepted for his skills and and we continue to rely on, on his own accounts. In August 1923, as Stalin's personal assistant, Bajanov became secretary of the Politburo and was responsible for taking notes of the meeting. Since he was present on every decision-making event and for he knew each and every Bolshevik leader, he, after his early 1928 defection, became a highly valuable asset for British and later on French intelligence. During the Winter War, he has offered his services, maybe without his French master's knowledge or contrary, for the Finns to organize a kind of Russian legion from the Soviet POWs in early 1940. He was given the chance, but before going to real war, the Winter War was over. Afterwards, the hero went back to Paris. The next service or collaboration of his is taking place in the mid of June 1941, when he has been invited, as he said, taken to Berlin for a small talk, talk and consultation with Reich, Reich Minister Rosenberg. As he says, I was waiting the usual questions regarding Stalin, but, end of quotation, instead he was led to know that the Nazis are preparing a war against the Soviet Union. According to Bajanov, he knew a few days earlier that the Germans are going to invade Russia. We can take for sure his meeting with Rosenberg in Berlin, on which, as he, later in 1979, he writes, he wrote, he tried to dissuade the Nazis to launch a war against the Russian nation, and instead, as he wrote, tried to argue through Rosenberg the Nazis to fight exclusively communism and the communist, but the Russian nation. He sadly confirmed later, later on that his advices were not taken by the Nazis. However, we can know from Bajanov that he was giving advices and information to British, to French, Finns, and Germans. And although he has left Moscow in late 1927, he has remained the man who saw Stalin. We know that as well as the OSS during the war later on, the CIA has invested huge energy and money to study the enemy leader's personal psychology, as well as the collective social psychology of the enemy. Let me just shortly bring one forgotten case on how and when to you, when to use the words of Albert Chernin, a leading American Zionist in the 1960s, 70s, dealing with Russian Jews, the Soviet Jews have been made an issue, or have not been. I refer now to the famous Harvard project in which between 1951 and 54, thousands of former Soviet citizens in the USA and in DP camps in Europe have been interviewed more or less deeply regarding various aspects of everyday life in the Soviet Union. And although questions have been put on the national question, the Soviet Jews in the Harvard project could not become an issue, 1951-54. But let us go back to Bajanov again. When he wrote his English, I'd say, American memoirs, the Soviet Jews are already an issue. In this text, Bajanov finds the Jewish, most precisely the anti-Semitic question, a crucial one. 
that the reader may find easily a system specific one. In his memoirs, Bajano very often brings up cases to illustrate Stalin's personal anti-Semitism, and beside this, he argues along the very system's anti-Semitic nature. He, while recollecting the inner party feuds, which always have taken place in his memoirs, with a very few uh, exceptions uh, between mediocratic and undereducated commies, he never misses to mention if the negative hero is a Jew or an anti-Semite. So in 1979, Bajanov has produced such a proper memoir, which very soon has become a fundamental part of the contemporary anti-communist criminology. It is not by chance that George R. Urban, the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's heads, I would say he was the political commissar, actually, of this great institution. So Urban's fundamental collection of key interviews on Stalinism is started with an interview with Bajanov. Even in this interview, Stalin's and the system's anti-Semitism plays a crucial role, and Urban, the specialist, doesn't ever ask back to Bajanov. He got from Bajanov what he wanted, See statements like this one. Of course, Stalin, a quotation from, from this interview, of course Stalin was a cautious devil. Having liquidated Jews at the top, he realized that with coming of Hitler, the retention of Jews and Jewish sympathies further down, further down the line might prove useful to him in his confrontation with Nazi Germany. But when Hitler was defeated and the benefits of Jewish support exhausted, Stalin's anti-Semitism broke surface again and was given official currency in the doctor's plot and Stalin's plan for what was to follow. Fortunately for Soviet Jewry, Stalin died before he could set, in, set it in train, end of quotation. My presentation wants to look after whether they are masking the inmate anti-Semitic nature uh, of of, of Stalinism, Boris Bajanov has really been so sensitive regarding the Jewish question before his American sponsor decades. And if he was, how he put into his previews, published in 1930-31 recollections, the Jewish questions. J Jewish question, luckily or unfortunately, Bajanov has already amassed Stalin and his system in, in French in 1930, uh, avec Stalin dans le Kremlin, and in German in 1931, Stalin der Rote Diktator. At that time, Bajanov could not be aware of the existence of Anhana Island, of the coming of a new age, which needed more sophisticated chimforts to describe communists than Jewish. The, present, my, the presentation wants to compare Bajanov, I wanted to compare Bajanov's 1930-31 recollections of the Soviet Jewish question and the anti-Semitism with the Krestomati like 1979 memoirs. So let us see what he wrote in 1930-31 on the Stalinian anti-Semitism. That was all. And now let us see what he wrote on the Jewish Bolsheviks. The same. And again, half a century later, he remembers each and every alleged anti-Semitic gesture of Stalin. He knows that Stalin was, was up to something horrible against the Soviet Jews before his death. And his conviction, as we saw it, was uncritically bought even by George or Urban, who was a really well-educated criminologist otherwise. I would say Bajanov's recollections on Stalin's and the Bolshevik system's systematical anti-Semitism are the product of this or Urban's conviction and that of the totalitarian, highly politicized approach towards Soviet and any kinds of communisms. It is not only Bajanov who, after Stalin's death, has remembered Soviet anti-Semitism. The last month I have spent in Moscow, beside other things, with reading less or totally unknown Russian Jewish memoirs. I've been focusing on one hand on the author's personal experiences on and off anti-Semitism, and on the other hand, the way they perceived and or reconstructed the memory of anti-Semitism. My experience is too fresh to sum up my findings, but I can tell you in advance one interesting fact. If the remembering person put into his, her, is his or her memoirs what Bajanov called something that only the death of Stalin saved them from, I mean the deportation, only in very few cases even another Holocaust is mentioned, he or she has always, he or she has had always access to the Soviet Jewish samizdat or refers into the memoirs to literature on the subject. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm going to move now to the last paper of the panel. Uh, last, our last speaker is Grzegorz Kuziewiec, who is assistant professor at the Institute of History, the Polish Academy of Sciences. 
Grzegorz has published extensively on Polish anti-Semitism, Polish Jewish relations and the right wing in Poland and East Central Europe in general. His book on chauvinism Polish style, the case of Roman Domowski, is forthcoming. Uh, its English translation is forthcoming. The Polish version has already been published in 2009. And he's now completing a new book on modern Polish antisemitism seen in a Central and East European context between 1880 and 1914. And the paper today deals with the Jewish revolution before Judeo-Bolshevism, the 1905 revolution in the East European anti-Semitic imagination. So we take a step back from the Russian revolution to the previous one. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. <coughs> kind introduction and invitation as well. There's always space for thanks for this kind uh, welcome here. And then briefly, and one, um, uh, one comment about the title. I focus on the Polish perspective. I put it in the title that was missed somewhere, but you have in mind my text will be corresponding, I expect, to especially Brandon, what's, what Brandon uh, has said, but it is still uh, in, in this version not extended when uh, um, uh, in Polish perspective is mine. So if you have understand what antisemitism at the turn of the centuries uh, meant, you have uh, uh, focus on two uh, things, uh, on two subcultures. Uh, Antisemitism as a socially acceptable political and economic project. In Poland was born during first decade of 1880s, and its main founder was Jan Jelenski, journalist, editor of a weekly soil, Rola in Polish. Uh, and this uh, uh, weekly had circulation uh, specifically between 19, uh, uh, 1886 and 1905 was estimated I, uh, <clears throat> as 4,400 uh, or 3,000 regular readers, which put the magazine in the middle of the opinion of the weeklies of that day, of that uh, epoch. Uh, and Soilers, as they called themselves, was convinced about the crisis of modernity and inevitable fall of the materialistic world. The conviction was, on the other hand, accompanied by the belief and Im imminent moral bright of the Christian community. Rola and Jelenski and many other uh, contributors uh, often addressed the proverbial ordinary man, implying that it's carried about the fate of every Catholic Paul, member of the religious and national community altogether. This new hostile approach to the Jews was built on the traditional anti judaic premises of economy and religion, but also on a more modern uh, foundation of the anti-anticipation and propaganda machinery. The weekly constant relied on the authority of the church, pointing out that anti judaic legislation and rooting its political and social message in Catholic uh, social teaching. If one tried to sum up the entire program of Frola with a single phrase, it would have to be a notion of an organic development of the spirit solidarity in the Christian, uh, in the Christian society. Quite interestingly, as regards our team today, socialists as such played any role in that reason. While at the very beginning, the paper's distribution and influence remained limited at the time, this entry uh, of an open anti-Semitic motives into world of 19th century Polish journalism set a significant, if not a turning point, both for future relations between Poles and Jews and in a much longer perspective for Polish Catholicism. I should have added that Rola Circle, that is really beginning of the political Catholicism in, uh, in Polish lands. Not to mention that under the condition of the material law of, in the Russian Poland, since the second half of the 19th century, precisely speaking, the generally uh, Polish insurrection of journalists remain only one, uh, only one way, uh, uh, on one of the ways of spreading a new uh, ideological propaganda. Another significant type of anti-Semitic group, I call them after the, the Shulamit Folkop anti-Semitic subcultures, came from the Polish National Democrats, which was part of a greater family of the founder circle New Nationalism. And from the very beginning, they call those new Polish nationalists, they call for new spiritual foundation, express a strong desire to transcend both the banality of bourgeois world 
and the anachronism of the feudal and post-feudal tradition, as well as materialism of 19th century, seem to some extent as a bewilderment of parliamentary democracy. However, in the center of political agenda of the early Polish nationalists were more practical themes, a problem which contributed to the formation of the char and the character of the Polish uh, integral nationalism of this time was the Jewish question. A discovery of the Jews for the whole nationalist movement as an integral enemy was in part inevitable. As the largest national minority in the underdeveloped country, the Jews suited this purpose very well. After the civil reforms of uh, 1860s, an increasing number of Jews moving into the cities of Russian Poland to begin constitute the bulk of the urban intelligentsia. However, in this Polish new nationalism, though paradoxically, at first only on its margin, on this, from the second perspective, on the, on, the, on the other hand, in the very center, has existed a recognizable anti-Semitic outlook represented by its main leader, Roman Dmowski. Dmowski anti-Semitism was much more than just political, and economic, and political on the uh, political agenda. There was a kind of Weltanschauung, a way of thinking, feeling, and acting that can express nearly all kinds of human grievances. In opposition to the aforementioned Catholic anti-Semites, at the head of the Mosque vision was the tenor principle of natural selection in which the stronger civilization, based on the pure racial entirety, was supposed to force its views on the weaker. Mosque saw the Jews not only a separate from Polish nation, too numerous or characterized by the too cultivated religion as many other Polish nationalists of the first generation claimed, but also a separate from the all Aryan countries, destructive by the nature, incapable, in unlike to other nations of moral regeneration, they were led by the rational instinct to dominate the whole world. All modern political system and political ideas coming from enlightenment with the Marxist socialist at the first place only served them as an instrumental tool to reach their goal. I would even risk that this mosque of first national generations coming up, uh, begin with, uh, with attack on the Marxists as, inven as the uh, invention of the Semitics, Semitic uh, instincts uh, in, the, in, in, in the early publication of the early nationalists in, 19, uh, uh, in 1890s. Dmowski, in one of his uh, ideological pieces entitled In Our Camp in 1901, uh, uh, as a league, upcoming uh, uh, nationalist league leader, come out and name the socialists, alongside the Jews, the most dangerous enemies of the developing new patriotism. In his view, the Jews not only had created socialism, but had done with, so with the aim to using as an instrument of their domination, an outlet, I quote, for the sectarian organizational instincts, end of quotation. It was meant to be an ideological lever to forward domination. The basic goal was meant to lead to another father and uh, one, not always understood, but even by its creators, to linking up with fellow compatriots in other countries. Although Dmowski did not at this juncture maintain that socialism as such was exclusively of of Jewish manufacture, poorly an expression of Jewish interest, as he uh, wrote. He at once concluded that only the future would reveal its real means, socialist real face. This paranoid and rational logic of, uh, of this pronouncement was spreading ever faster among Polish nationalists. Even not every member of this group rem uh, uh, immediately accepted every resultant consequence. However, it would be uh, simplification, oversimplification, to believe that in the first uh, years of the 20th century it was the anti-Semitism that most strongly attracted new groups of supporters uh, to the nationalists. As, as far as we know, as, as historian has persuaded, 
the revolution of 95 marked a clear watershed in Polish politics, in all politics. It started in Russian Poland, but affected all Polish politics. Not mentioning the relation between Poles and Jews in the, um, in the Russian Empire. At the very outset in 1905, at the beginning of 95, Poles and Jews mean Polish revolutionaries or Polish public opinion, and the Jews, Jewish public opinion, struggling side by side against the Russian authorities. But when violence and anarchy grew in the late 1905, in, in the half of 95 and, uh, and afterwards, and perhaps even more in 1906, when the government, Tsarist government repressions lashed out at revolutionaries, and in the end at the public opinion, the desire upon the Christian public to find scapegoats elsewhere grew even more intense. At that time, the imagination of Polish conservatives were was hunted, were hunted more deeply than ever before by the specter of the revolution understood as a result of the socialist, of the Jewish socialist plots. Fears of upsetting of natural order, total anarchy, and anxieties about the future of the nation were common amongst the middle classes. The social and cultural establishment, and last not least, the Catholic Church. Thus the figure of the Jewish revolutionary perfectly suited these Phobias. Henryk Sienkiewicz, Polish literature Nobel Prize winner, the most famous Polish writers of this epoch, may be here an emblematic example. His views, the views of, of, uh, of this famous writer, who is close to the right, to the modest right conservatives, show clearly how Polish traditionalists took over the anti-Semitic motive and inscribed them in the wider cultural pattern. During the 95 revolution, Sienkiewicz noted in his uh, uh, correspondence uh, uh, over the overrepresentation and excessive mobility of the Jews among the radicals, and more and more warned his close friends and relatives against the Eastern newcomers who spread seditious slogans and provoked pogroms. In his exposition, there were no straightforward anti-Semitic antisemites, as we can do, but there was a fear of unsettlement of a natural order and anxiety about the future associated, about the future of the nation, associated um, almost always with the Eastern Jews. That was the time when Jan Jelenski, I mentioned before, an infamous godfather of Polish antisemitism briskly opposed the revolutionary events of 1905, blaming the Jews for causing social unrest. At this time, he felt the winds in his sails. He set up a common daily and tried to spread such popular catchphrases as do, do not buy at Jewish shops or beware of the Jews, with his political message nationwide. By the autumn 1905, when the revolution approached its peak, the very first wave of the accusation of the foreign elements foisting of innocent Polish and Christian opinion was widely aired in nearly all Catholic dailies of the that day. Not only common daily of Jelenski, but nearly all Catholic daily and weeklies as well. In all those articles, a foreign and hostile airman was at the most cases identified strictly with the Jews. But then appeared a new competitor on this scene. In contrast to Jelenski and other Catholic anti-Semites of this time, national Democrats had at their disposal not only centralized media concerned, of which they built it the, very, um, the first half of 1905, but as well a mass party organization. Within early months of 1906, this propaganda machine could spread over nearly uh, all country and won comprehensive victory in the uh, Congress Poland uh, first election in 1906 and 97 to the Russian state Duma. In this respect, the vision of disciplined society governed by national organization defined by Moscow and articulated at length by national democracy appeared to numerous poor, to numerous poles as authentic bar against the chaos of revolution. It also appeared as the only way to preserve Polish national identity. Moski personal approach to the Jewish question revealed then for the very first time in the Russian Poland and then in the all Polish lands such a tremendous political uh, potentiality. 
The revolution 1905 opened a unique discursive window in which this aggressive and chauvinist concept of the nation, which had all originated on narrow circles of radical right, um, could be voiced, debated, and in some way institutionalized. Upon the establishment of the party, National Democrats functioned as a small conspiration and mostly male fraternity, about 200 people. After 95, the ranks swelled to approximately 20 or 40 members, at which point national democracy may be labeled as a mass party. The nationalist critic of the revolution focused largely on the Jews. The national democracy press propaganda presented the index as a sort of national shield and kind of a fortress against the deluge of anarchy, everyday, everyday street violence, and the taggeries. Nonetheless, almost all the roles of Aryan forces were then clearly identified with the Jews. The presence of the Jews, the severe grip on the Polish life, began to be taken as a chief explanation for all troubles that emerged in the Polish society. Last but not least, Jews uh, have been claimed as the enemy of the Polish independence as such. What was the key to the index success in, at this point? I guess, or I think, uh, were, was two uh, folded. One, for sure, and primarily that was a challenging the revolution, seen for the most as a violent anarchy, an apocalyptic act with rioting all over the country. An effective manipulation of these contrarevolutionary fears and anxieties. From this time, forward, authority, national solidarity, and anti-left hysteria, last but not least, strong leadership, were among the key items of the nationalist agenda. This new politics mixing anti-socialist, authoritarian message with a strong anti-Jewish motives with the picture of the Jewish revolutionary within the framework of the dominant anti-leftist fears reached its peak in central Poland during 96, 90, seven bloodletting in uh, Łódź, the events of the blood uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Łódź. Since the last 1905, then the National Democrats has been writing and speaking about the threat posed by Jews, arguing that employ different methods to destroy nations and most using political radicalism and revolution as such. To conclude, Historically speaking, the invention of the Jewish left can be traced back to 19th century debates about the alleged engagement of the Jews in revolution, revolutionary venture that eventually ends up in anarchy and disorder. You find many tropes in the European history, Eastern European as well, as well Western history on that. However, in the context of East European politics, social and cultural scene, the events of 1905 revolution seems to me to be a dramatic change which still not be fully recognized and understood. As far as we know, all regimes are barren ground for rightist movements and attitudes, which needs an open air for political rivalry and combat as much as the ideological adversaries on the left. In the Tsarist Russia, it was only with the government's retreat in the stormy days of 95 revolution, that the Rus uh, Russian right as a political movement was born, only to decline again in the strength and importance as the authorities, the Tsarist authorities, recovered confidence and control. It is striking that when Russian parallel group to the Polish National Democrats, uh, the Union of Russian Peace, Soyuz Ruski Dio, Red, uh, or Black, yeah. uh, in the years 1907 and 8, gradually lost dynamism, unity, and mass appeal before the government of, in the Petrograd recovered strength under the guidance of Piotr Stolypin, Prime Minister Piotr Stolypin. Nevertheless, many could agree with Eugene of Routin's statement that the revolution of 95, I quote, popularized racist stereotypes of images as violence and disintegration erupted a censorship, it's very important, law and public opinion were liberalized and the commercial culture proliferated, end of quotation. When the time went on, this bitter legacy was ready to pick up. 
the Polish index in contrast to the Russian com fellows, though not we, without problems, grew systematically. By the end of by, by the Great War, despite some inner splits and breakups, the nationalist movement considerably strengthened its mass base, remaining both and most powerful political force and the largest social movement in Polish territories. Popular antisemitism and absorption of the anti-Jewish xenophobia in mass popular culture also play a role in all this. Quite interestingly, although the large section of the East European societies, I mean Russian and, and, and Polish in this context, were dominated by the specter of the revolution perceived as the outcome of the socialist Jewish conspiracy, those resentments, resentments were not exploited immediately, whatever in the field of illustration, uh, ballet, or literature. However, when, whether discussion of the Litva question in Polish lands, which began in a daily press in autumn 1909, and the Belize affair in the whole Russian Empire, meaning as well the Polish lands, erupted in 19. 11, all those aforementioned emotions and the pictures and this logical structure, logical or uh, linguistic structures, came back with enormous vehemence. The figure of the Jew started to take on features that were malevolent, eventually downright demonic. The already existing crude, rough, hewn pleasantry about Jews now turned maliciously and in, into aggressive way. For the East European popular cultures of the time, negative conception of the Jews become the Durkheimer, I suppose, equivalent of the collective consciousness, bonding society like tight night biological organism. With this toxic cocktail of xenophobia, aggressive nationalists, and generalized antisemitism, large part of those societies entered into the First World War. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for your presentation, Grzegorz. Uh, we have roughly half an hour for discussion, questions. So I'll open the floor. Faith, one, two, three, okay. Yeah. Stefan. Thank you again for three wonderful papers. My question is for McGeever. Actually, I have, I have two questions. My first question is about ideology. I think that you, your, my first question is about ideology. Uh, I think you argued really convincingly that anti-Semitism, at least in this Ukrainian civil war context, is sort of the ideology. But I'm curious about the, the peasants you mentioned sw switching sides. So you said a lot of these, these partisans had been involved in anti-Bolshevik activity before that. So do you have any sense of how, why, and when exactly people decide to switch sides? And then my second question is if you can give us a sense of how discipline is eventually regained. It, would you connect kornizatsia in Ukraine as a, as to this? Is it a way of sort of creating a, a good nationalism, allowing Ukrainians to liberate themselves socially and economically um, without anti-Semitism? So the answer yeah, I think, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, thanks. Um, the, the I mean, this is complete meltdown, as you very well know, in Ukraine in 1919. I mean, there's central apparatuses of power have basically been dissolved in terms of their ability to control the peripheries and the, the rural towns. So the question of switching sides is a very instrumental one often. I mean, it's a question of survival um, and a question of, you know, maintaining the needs of subsistence and so on and so forth. But I think it's more than that. Um, the, the ease with which these peasants could move between different seemingly antithetical political camps was because of this actual discursive crossover within those camps, which was a kind of revolutionary radical populism. The Bolsheviks were using similar language to actually some of their, the, their opponents, at least in terms of you know, mobilizing class resentment. Uh, as I tried to say, the reason that this had the unexpected consequence of mass anti-Semitic violence uh, was because of the profound disjuncture between what these concepts meant above and what they meant on the ground. 
Um, but it, it is instrumental and there's a kind of strong discursive ideological overlap. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that answers the, the first question. The second one of how, which I think was how is all this put to a stop and is Karenizatia important? I think in the first instance it's put to, this, it's put to a stop by, you know, if I can use an Althusser concept, the, the repressive apparatus reappears, having been completely, you know, um, broken down. It reappears. The, the, the Bolsheviks now start to screen their uh, local cadres, they start to kick out the anti-Semites, and it's basically power through terror. That's a direct quote, actually, from one of the Bolshevik leaders in Ukraine. We are maintaining our grip simply through terror. And then after that, I think Lenin wins the argument eventually um, in the early 20s for a much more nuanced national perspective, which later, obviously after Lenin's out the equation, becomes Karenizatsia. I, I think that has a more lasting significance, but in the short term, this is put to a stop with a repressive state apparatus. Um, these people aren't won over to Bolshevism <laughs> in the immediate context. Yeah, thanks. Um, I also have a question and a comment both for Brandon. Um, the question refers to the beginning of your paper when you spoke about the demarcation lines and them not representing the situation on the ground. Um, it seems to me that those demarcation lines also were quite powerful instruments to actually confront anti-Semitism. And I was just wondering um, to which degree the Bolshevik intellectuals and leaders were aware of the discrepancy between the demarcation lines and the situation on the ground, and uh, to which degree they were consciously using those demarcation lines in such an instrumental way. Uh, and the comment goes to the end of your paper when you were speaking about the relationship about universal and the particular, uh, and that the, the, the universal is in a way best uh, um, uh, uh, actualized from a, from a particular point of view, I think that it is necessary that to introduce another distinction here, which is probably as, as uh, uh, instable and, and uh, problematic as the other ones, which is the distinction between the subaltern and the hegemonial, because I'm not so sure whether um, the, the, your, your, your notion is still holds if, it, if the particular is being articulated from a, from a hegemonial point of view, rather I'm pretty sure it is not, it's only holes if it's articulated from a subaltern point of view. And I was just wondering what you think about this. Uh. So it's a really difficult question. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, a really great one. The first one of where the Bolsheviks aware that their language is being appropriated in this way, absolutely. I mean, they have some sources from the archives, minority sources in this Bolshevik government who are saying, we should not have this explicit campaign about smash the bourgeoisie because this is understood on the ground in the wrong way. We should think of doing something different. But they don't have anything different. And also, it is true that this class politics is a good way of fighting anti-Semitism. The situation the Bolsheviks are in, though, that, is that every single discursive, ideological, and political step taken here perpetuates anti-Semitism. It does not matter what they do. You cannot avoid anti-Semitism here. So it's a question of mitigation, right? So they agonize about what to do. More Jews in government, less Jews in government. Should we have Jews in the Red Army on the front? Should we have no Jews in the Red Army? Should we, you know, should we have quotas, but that will perpetuate anti-Semitism? Should we defend, you know, um, Jews very openly? Should we do it quietly? Should we do it through class or through a Jewishness? There is an agonizing predicament because anti-Semitism is so profoundly pervasive in every political subjectivity. In an, in an uneven way, but it's present. Uh, it's explosive. So they're aware, but they make a decision. And you know what? These are decisions made in moments of absolute crisis. They make a decision to go with the class politics. And that does stop anti-Semitism and it perpetuates it. So I mean... Uh, the question of hegemonic and subaltern is a really great one. I, I, I really need to think about that. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you a proper answer just now, but other than to say that these minority subaltern groups relative to, you know, Russian Bolsheviks, these Jewish revolutionaries, Jewish Jews, to use that problematic term, um, are subaltern, but they are using the language of the, he of the hegemonic. But in a very careful way, they add little things like revolution will stop anti-Semitism, class consciousness is the only way. We need a separate campaign against anti-Semitism that we will control. So it's kind of, 
It's, I, I can't say much more than that, other than that I'll go and think about it, and I thank you for the suggestion. Okay, uh, I have also a question for Brandon. <laughs> he seems to be very busy today. Um, I was wondering about these programs that you were talking about. Uh, you were saying that you, you will give us an explanation on the reasons why, and I'm, I'm even more curious about that. Um, regarding the socio-economic background and the connections between the uh, U Ukrainian, mostly than uh, soldiers in the Red Army, were they going back to their localities, I mean their hometowns, do you have any kind of personal connections between the, the soldiers and, and, the, and those who were killed? Uh, because I find this, and my second question is, is that were all of these killed, were they Jews or were any other category included? Because I mean, that's also one way of rethinking the concept of anti-Semitism if they really were Jews killed in the end. Thank you. Um, another really great question that the sources are not particularly forgiving on the first one. Uh, who are these people? Are they returning to the localities? It seems like in the, the, the main troops, like Grigoriev's troops and these Soviet armies, are being sent all across Ukraine in desperate fashion, traveling the length of the country to put down rebellions here and there. But what they do is they mobilize local resources too. You know, and these, these, this social base is moving between these different camps of, you know, Bolshevism or Ukrainian nationalism. So, the main troops that are coming in and taking regional power are not locals, but they use locals to, you know, support themselves. And then they turn against each other. And uh, beyond that, I can't say much. I mean, the, 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 the problem is this, the best sources are the Central Red Army ones, and they don't have a clue what's going on. They just do not understand what's going on. I think the 8th Army is, is an Uman. I think they are anti-Semitic. Let's send in the 7th. Oh no, the 7th are the anti-Semitic ones, the 8th are actually the proletarian ones. Let's do that differently. And then the message by the time it reaches the centre is lost, the moment's gone, a new army has moved in, they've rebelled anyway. I mean, we can't think of this in kind of very detailed essentialist terms because it's so incredibly fluid. Um, this is complete chaos. It, it really is. Um, I'm not trying to avoid the question, I just think that is the nature of what's going on. Um, this is really important, who was killed? Because that Grigoriev statement you saw is like these Muscovite uh, Christ killers, these Russian, you know, and so on and so forth. It's very anti-Russian. Russians don't appear to be among the mass uh, murdered. And if anyone has worked in Ukraine can correct me on that. I've not found e any evidence of anti-Russian pogroms, always anti-Jewish. And I think that does say a lot about the grip of anti-Semitism. Um, but it is an anti-Russian politics. But there's a distance between rhetoric and, you know, murder. And anti-Semitism fills that gap, I think. Maria? Yeah, um, I'm afraid I will put extra strains on uh, Brandon today. <laughs> I will follow up uh, your question because I have uh, briefly dealt in my life with Odessa. Uh, Greeks and Jews there somehow forming this very detasteful class of political and economic uh, speculators which um, more or less did feel the iron hand of the Bolshevik um, presence. And I would like to ask you, if I may, to comment on how this super ethnic class uh, ideology in action and wording Actually, in action and wording relate to the special weight of anti-Semitism. Because there was an, uh, also the Bolshevik troops somehow more or less expelled, not just the, not just the, or they tried to contain Jewish threat, uh, not only the Jewish threat in Odessa, but they also moved many Greeks to leave Odessa, many Germans left Odessa mm -hmm. after the revolution. And how do you um, integrate the special weight of anti-Semitism anti in this also anti-ethnic, or should I say, super-ethnic class issue? Yeah. Well, this is really, a great question. I mean, one of the things they do is to say, you know, uh, this is not, the, de the Bolshevik project is about de-emphasizing ethnicity, right? As, in terms of rhetoric, 
but in practice they're building you know local autonomous oblasts in a slightly later period and then republics and actually emphasizing ethnicity so there's a kind of dialectic there the question of how combating anti-semitism which i think is your question how this relates to the supra-ethnic political project what i found is that the way the most reliable uh, military forces for combating anti-Semitism are precisely these multi-ethnic Red Army brigades of Hungarians, Germans, Jews, Latvians. Latvian, less so in Ukraine, but they are there, and, and actually Chinese as well. So there's, th there's this, every time I find it's this fourth uh, Soviet army, international army, which has got hardly any Ukrainians and hardly any Russians in it. They are always the one getting sent to the south of Ukraine to put down. Uh, no, I don't know. Well, there might be a few, but they're, they're not mentioned. Um, and of course, who is it that takes Odessa in early 1919? It's Grigoriev that kicks out the Greeks. Yep. And Rakovsky, head of the Soviet government, says this is the most fabulous achievement of Soviet power yet. Grigoriev's glorious Sixth Army has taken Red Odessa. Weeks later, he's slaughtering the Jews. Um, so. Bad luck, Brendan. Um, so it's another question for Brendan. Um, sorry about this. But it's basically, it's, a, it's an issue of these perpetrators. And pe you, know, you use peasant in a very yeah. monolithic way. And yet, it's like we don't really know very much about these perpetrators. I mean, you, use kind of, you talk of sort of ethnic ethnicity, but how much ethnic consciousness can we actually ascribe to these peasants? And the second point is, Marxist theory of rural society is that you know it's potatoes in a, it's undifferentiated pe potatoes in a sack of potatoes. We know that rural society is deeply stratified, deeply cleavaged, social status, class, you know, market relations, and all these other things. And whether or not we have any evidence of perpetrator voice or evidence that the perpetrators come from a particular segment of rural society? Are they specifically young? Are they landless? Are they, you know, are, they, are the landless, for example, being mobilized against those with land? Are, they being, are those who deal with merchants being mobilized against merchants? Yeah. Um, and is there targeting that way? Yeah, that's, thanks, it's yeah. a great question. I, I would take a slight issue of disagreement. I don't think the Bolshevik brand of Marxist theory on rural society is monolithic or just potatoes. Sure, there would be some, you know, Bolsheviks that thought that way, but there's actually a very sophisticated, uh, er, very early Soviet theoretical discussion, intellectual discussion about what constitutes rural society. And Lenin, of course, actually wrote a lot about this. In the very early period, in the, in the, in the 1890s, he had this hugely stratified understanding of class, of, of, of peasant class society. And this later becomes a, the, the context after 1917 for a really profound debate about this. And there's a couple of books written by Terry Cox just on this, I think, back in the, in the 70s and early 80s. So I think there's a, it's, it's not the case that they just see them all as, a, as a one and the same thing. And they do have a stratified analysis of peasant anti-Semitism. They say it's the kulaks, of course, this is this which is a, actually a very monolithic term, used in a very crude way. They say, oh, it's the rich peasants, the real toilers aren't anti-Semitic, it's the rich ones who want to protect their lot. Uh, I basically don't buy this. Um, I think this is political rhetoric. Uh, I haven't been able to, to ascertain which specific parts of peasant society are doing this, because either the sources don't tell you, or they just say it's all the kulaks. And I know it's not just the kulaks, because anti-Semitism is diffuse, unevenly, but nevertheless diffuse, across the social structure in this period and in this part of the world. Um, so perhaps this does come a lot across in the way I gave the talk as being monolithic, which would be unfair, because there are obviously peasants, workers, and any social strata that are anti-anti-Semitic. 
Um, but that doesn't deny the truth, which is that anti-Semitism can be found in every social strata. i uh, just give you one anecdote on this. There's an amazing source in the archives where the Red Army arrive and say, where are the Yids? We want, to, we want to kill them all. And the local peasants say, oh, no, 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 don't kill them. They're not Yids. They're with us. And this is, a, this is the local shtetl. They say, we'll take you to the Yids. They're over here. And they go to the next shtetl and say, there's, they, there's the Jews there. So it's profoundly localized. Who is Jewish and who is not Jewish is always being constructed. Uh, the local shtetl were not Jews in this context. It was them over there. So, but you really need a profoundly local study, you know, regional case studies to get to the answers that you want to do. Uh, I just couldn't do it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Rory? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks very much for the presentations. They're all really, really excellent. I had a question for Brendan, and I also have a question for Tamas as well, so actually some, somebody different. So uh, my question for Tamas is, um, so the kind of anti-Jewish campaigns uh, in the communist era, not, not just in the Soviet Union, but in you know, countries like Hungary and, and Romania and so on, I want to know how much of that was due to the fact that people did switch sides during the war, and that people who had maybe been in the Arab Cross or the Iron Guard or these different kind of far-right organizations then kind of swap sides sort of near the end of the war because they realized that the communist parties or the resistance were going to be the people in power and so people did swap sides. Uh, my question for Brendan, first of all a comment, um, this, this phenomenon you were talking about which is related to what I uh, just asked Thomas, uh, which is about you know people swapping sides and they're kind of moving, this is something which happens a lot during the Second World War and um, for example in Yugoslavia where the partisans have amnesties for people who've been in the Eustache movement and you find people who've actually been concentration camp guards and special police, they swap sides and then what they do after the war is they use the communist party as a means of pursuing their own agendas which are often very nationalistic agendas which is why you get a very kind of funny kind of uh, rhetoric after the Second World War and, and I, so my question kind of is you're looking at Ukraine uh, as we heard yesterday Ukraine has a particular kind of demographics, particular history, particular set of things are going on there and I'm wondering to what extent what's happening in Ukraine is kind of similar to what's happening elsewhere or whether, so is it a case of the Bolshevik army launching anti-Semitic campaigns or is it a question of people who already have a particular anti-Semitic agenda or particularly anti-Semitic uh, prejudices using, you know, the, the filter of the Bolshevik army or the Red Army in order to pursue politics as, you know, they were doing in Yugoslavia. So, so I'm just wondering how representative what's going on in Ukraine is, is it wider, or is it really something that we're talking about Ukraine specifically rather than kind of the rest of the Soviet Union? So. Uh, did I understand you correctly if your question is related, at least to me, uh, on, on, on the legacy of Iron Cross and other kind of Nazism, Nazi movement and the post-war anti-Jewish politics in Eastern Europe. Um, let me bring another, to, to, to paraphrase Lenny, let me go another way by Yom Drugin Putyom, and to bring you one uh, anti-Jewish, uh, so to say, politics that was really successful. It was the Czechoslovakian case. No bloody Iron Guard, no bloody whatsoever uh, movement. But there was a, a, a really uh, successful, in very many quotation marks, anti-Zionist campaign. I wouldn't say that this pre-war Nazi or Nazi like uh, popular sentiments legacy is, 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 is the reason. But maybe that's a, a, a leg legitimate, uh, uh, so to say, um, um, understanding of, 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 the, of the surfacing of anti-Semitism in anti-Jewishness, I would make a different between, between anti-Jewishness and anti-Semitism. So the surfacing of anti-Jewishness in the high politics in Eastern Europe, maybe, but maybe not. And this is the Czechoslovakian case, which well, makes me a little bit doubtful regarding this uh, approach. Did I give you a kind of, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rory, for the analogy of the Second World War. Uh, it's a really fruitful one to think about that. And for the question about representativeness, which is the, the question that really uh, I'm constantly trying to deal with in the, in the book that I'm writing. Um, 
Depends how we define anti-Semitism. If we define anti-Semitism as pogromist violence, then, it's, then Ukraine is not representative. I mean, there are pogroms in you know, the western borderlands and other parts of Russia, but it's not remotely comparable to what goes on in Ukraine. But if we define anti-Semitism as this kind of, dis in, in, in a discursive sense, and all, all, all these, these projections of you know, Jews as speculators, Jews not joining the Red Army, Jews in control of the government, Jews as the oppressors, all this, then that is diffuse across Really, actually, most of Russia, you can find it in the same Svodki, the same uh, Bolshevik reports. They're, they're finding the same stuff, but it doesn't produce that murderous form of anti-Semitic violence. Why is that? Well, I mean, on the one hand, in Petrograd, Moscow, and other you know, industrial regions where you can find such anti-Semitism in the working class, it's a profoundly different conjuncture in terms of power, state power. It's very, very different. And also, I mean, if I can paraphrase Marx, or just actually quote Marx, you know, ideas exist. The question is, where do they gain a material force? In Ukraine, this, this anti-Semitism has traction and gains a material force because of the unique conjuncture of that place, which is class relations, breakdown of, uh, of uh, authority and power, and all-out civil war. In Russia, you don't have the same conditions there, and you don't also have the same social structure either. But anti-Semitism is absolutely present uh, within the working class and within the peasantry. So I wouldn't want to leave the impression that there's no anti-Semitism in Russia and it's just Ukraine, but I also want, wouldn't want to leave the impression that Ukraine equals Russia. It's, if that, don't know if that answers it adequately or not. But. If there are no more questions from the, from the public, I can maybe ask my own. And I have one for Grzegorz, actually. Um, to what, I mean, First, it's a question and a comment. The comment is, I don't know if, I, I'm, if you can generalize this for East Central Europe. Because I'm thinking of, of the Romanian context, and the 1905 revolution is, doesn't exist in the Romanian context. In the 1907 revolution, Jews are in a completely different position. They are the ones attacked by the revolutionaries as sort of like agents of, of the establishment. So I think, I, I think your narrative was convincing for the Polish case, but I would be careful with generalizing for East Central Europe. Uh, that was at least my impression. And the second the, a question was related to agency. To what extent do you think the instrumentalization of anti-Semitism by the National Democrats is important in producing this notion of Jewish revolutionary. And to what extent, do you, I mean, what, what's the interplay between elite and popular anti-Semitism in the, in the developments you described? Could you please again repeat the, the so, first section of the second uh, okay. question? I mean, you, you mentioned in your presentation that these notions of, uh, Jewish, of, of Jews as agents of revolution was already present in the 19th century as a, as a stereotype. So what do you think in the post-1905 uh, context that we, were, that we were talking about? Um, what, how, how important do you think is the role of agency? Is the how important is the instrumentalization by the National Democrats or by the Mosky of this trope of the Jewish revolutionary in sort of embedding this into a, a tradition of, of, uh, of Polish anti-Semitism, of, of reshaping that, that yeah. tradition. And for Brendan, I also wanted to ask you something. Uh, that quote you gave us is, has a very profound, I mean, it has a very poignant religious element. So to what extent in other uh, appeals, in other anti-Semitic appeals, how present is religion? How, how present are the sort of like pre-revolutionary because, I, I mean, to me this looks like popular anti-Semitism. Again, it goes against the, the notion of uh, anti-Semitism being elite and being um, always sort of like pushed by, by elites on the population. This, this looks very much like peasant anti-Semitism. Like, to what extent do you think this is the case? Or to what extent do you still see the way that this uh, um, discourse was, uh, I don't know, worked by elites? pre-revolutionary Russia. Thanks very much for the question. Uh, <clears throat> I specifically use, even in the title East European anti-Semitic imagination, to, uh, to omit the debate about East Central Europe, in a way, and specifically address some part of the Russian Empire, with a Poles, Russian, Ukrainians, 
which, some which is not so much visible from my paper in, uh, I would say in a way consciously, but unconsciously it would be clear that some, it is some way different from some Polish land from Habsburg Empire, which in my meaning, in my reasoning, belongs to East Central Europe or Therefore, but the result of this revolution, in my reasoning, is that it started in the Russian part of Poland, in the Russian Empire, or in, in specifically what I, what, I'm, what I was dealing with was the Polish lands, but spreading all, all over Polish minds, even in, I would say, the the, the German part of the, the latest Polish Commonwealth, which has no specifically any interest in such interest what what happening in the Russia. Okay. Therefore, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I didn't tackle even the Romanian case, which is something different. In 96, in 97, this upheaval, pe peasant upheaval and, uh, and the meaning, but, <clears throat> But in a sense, from the other way, I think this revolution has some meaning from all European antisemitism on the level of ideas, on the level of the, some structural uh, linkage between Eastern Jews, Russian Jews, socialists, Marxism, and, uh, and vision of anarchy, which was in a way, in 1919 or in 1920, transferred to Western, Western uh, Europe during the Versailles Conference. All this publication about the protocols of Elder Sinan was, in a way, inspired by emigrants from the Western Europe, or whether inspired from the people as a person, from acting person, but from ideas. That, that, was my, that, that was my reason. About your second question, which was very much complicated and tough to, uh, about the instrumental, instrumental, instrumentalization of the, uh, of the Jewish revolution. Now, that, that's true. That's, that's the success was the, this effective instrumentalization, some stereotype where was wearing in a, in a press, but I think it become much more does than antisemitism is much more in interesting in that context. A, a kind of situation from the land under the Matka law, which almost everything is closed or association or press as censor or under the censorship to the semi semi open society when fast everything is, is free to to publicize, to be voiced, to, to, to say something public. Jews are revolutionary and, and it is not under the censorship of the, of the, 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 Russian, the, the Russian functionaries. It, it is after 1995, it is free 95. People start to talk about and the, the people published about the articles on this, on the massive wave, on the on Im, uh, incomparable to, to, to what, was, what, was be, what was before. Uh, and what's, uh, what, is, uh, um, what is the interplay between the public and the pop uh, on the elitist or high elitist uh, anti-Semitism and, uh, and, uh, and the public uh, imagination or the public uh, uh, public uh, see? I think maybe my my uh, maybe my point of view is much more stereotypical of stereotype, stereotypes in, in that sense, but I believe in the public, it was store, it, it was very widespread opinions that the kind of old-fashioned opinions about Jews that was dominance, in the sense of un, some anti-Judaic prejudices or some anti-resentments, and was uh, and what not so easy, I would say, uh, besides the cities, the big cities to instrumentalize this Jewish revolutionary in a, in a proper way. How to, into, how to in, in, in the, into the village in, instrumentalize the, Jew, the Jewish as the revolution which had happened in the village in the other way. So this interplay, I would say, uh, took place between 1907 and 1913. That was a long period with this message was produced 
and repeats it and repeats it and repeats it to, I would say, to, 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 fabri to fabricate it some, some, some sort of a consciousness about uh, the, 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 what the people, what the popular, what is the popular, what is the uh, popular feeling among the public. So it is not very at the very beginning. Uh, it is not so obvious. But, uh, but I would put an accent on the instrumentalization, on the process of intimacy, which is, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, on, the, uh, on the very last sentence, not very well researched on, on that level. We don't know what, how it works to, 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 to the very end. I would agree. That's why I find your case so out of the usual pattern of yeah. instrumentalization. Yeah. Uh, a really great question, religion. Um, Pre-revolutionary anti-Semitism anti and religious anti-Semitism, are they present? Absolutely. Um, but is this only pre-revolutionary religious anti-Semitism? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But is it present? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is pushed by the elites. It's pushed by anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist elites, by the whites, by intellectuals, and so on and so forth. And what are they saying? They're saying, we need, this is the era of mass politics, and we need to fight this new alien foreign political project, this new ideology of communism, of Jewish communism, and restore our political project. But they're doing so through mass mobilization. Protocols are being published at this time as well. So it's, it's the mobilization of pre-revolutionary anti-Semitic anti culture for a very modern political end, I would argue. Um, and religion is key for the Bolsheviks too, because they, is, what's really interesting is in the reports of the Red Army, they have like, the, the, the Sixth Soviet Army is an open revolt, is full of anti-Semites. All of the instructors we have, the agitators, are Jews. Dash, send Russians, send Ukrainians. We need to get these, our Jews out of here and send in Russians and Ukrainians to speak to our anti-Semitic social base. On one and two occasions, I found in the reports it said, didn't say send Russians, it said send Orthodox. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this. So actually sometimes the Bolsheviks are so desperate they will send in <laughs> anyone who will stop this. Um, and by the way, just last, last, last thing on this anti-religious campaigns of the early 20s, anti-Semitism, this is, this is quite established in the literature, that anti-Semitism is a huge issue here. Uh, Kalinin and others actually say in the Central Committee in the Politburo, under no circumstances must Comrade Trotsky have anything to do with this anti-religion campaign. Because they know what this will do. This will be a further perpetuation of the, you know, the pre-revolutionary religious anti-Semitism that is finding new expression in this post-revolutionary moment. And if I can just finish on another Marxist theorist, Althusser has a concept of articulation, which I think is really important here. Uh, Pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary forms of anti-Semitism are articulating through new political projects. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so vicious and so multifaceted and so hard to defeat. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you to all our three speakers. And now uh, I was asked to let you know that it's lunch, well, it's already lunchtime, so we will just move to lunch downstairs to Sala Terena. <laughs> so, thank you once again. Thank you.